Okay, welcome everybody. This is our next uh, SBSS program, and I'm so happy to have Greg, Greg Norsworthy. Uh, he's one of my trusted advisors for all things DLG, as well as cross country flying and, and thermal duration. He's just a wealth of knowledge, and he's really helped a lot of us in the hobby. And um, he's been involved with several of my builds of DLGs. And now both of us are finding that we're, we're buying a few more DLGs than we're building. And um, I'm pretty excited that he has a new one that, that I wanted to have him talk about as part of our series of new DLG plans. So, so Greg, uh, why don't you take it away? Okay, um, thanks for having me on. Um, tonight we're gonna be talking about the Falcon, which uh, you can get from Oleg. You can find him on RC Groups. Um, I'm gonna bring it up here and, and just show it kind of unboxed. Uh, it comes with some very nice metallic wing bags to keep the sun off. Uh, since it's a raw carbon finish, a lot of it. Uh, it's, it, and these are very well made, very durable. Let's open this up. This HQ high quality on it, and it's not just PR. Um, this really is a high quality airplane in every sense of the word. Now, um, now I heard it was modestly priced. Um, uh, is that it is, true? It is modestly priced. I can't remember exactly how much it is. But it's not, it's like in between the high end and the, and the cheap ones, right? It's in between the high and the cheap ones. It's not the cheapest one out there, but, but it's a pretty good value. You can see it also comes with these little tail bags that fit really well. They're sewn to size for this. Um, the tails are all black in this case. You can get glass tails with pigment so that you can tell your airplane from some of the other ones. Uh, this one came with carbon tails. It's got a uh, colored nose cone, 2.4 safe, non-carbon front end. Um, the paint on it is is pretty nice. Uh, bottom is also painted. And they come in very, very bright colors. So it shouldn't be too hard to tell yours from someone else's. Now, I'll explain a little bit about uh, why I bought this and selected this particular airplane. If you can show that picture with me uh, standing with its, its predecessor there. This is the skinny pickle. Or... It is the skinny pickle. Yeah. Um, I've been sort of chasing this design space for a while. I looked up the skinny pickle thread and was shocked to see it was 2013. <laughs> um, after seeing the XXL, if anyone's familiar with the XXL, it was, it was the first really popular molded, very high aspect ratio VLG in the, in the marketplace. Um, they weren't made for too long and they were kind of hard to get, but there were a few in the area. And odd coincidence, I happened to run into one just a couple of weeks ago at a field and flew against it. And they're actually, pretty good um, given the age of it being almost uh, 10 years old now yeah um, but the the advantage is you go with a very high aspect ratio wing and a much lower weight and to get you in the same wing loading range as a bigger plane but for those of us who are not gifted with really good throwing arms or those of us who are older. <laughs> yeah, okay, that too. Um, I found that in the in the contest, sure, the other guys could outthrow me, um, but not by uh, a huge amount. And I wasn't too far out of competitive at the beginning of the contest. But by the end of a two-day tournament, I had gotten quite tired and throwing that larger airplane, a regular size DLG, was getting to be a bit difficult and was probably going to lead eventually to shoulder injury if I kept doing that over and over. So I felt like when I saw the XSL come out, um, a guy named Mike Stern was flying it at, at uh, Poway and did impressively well with it. Um, 
enough that a lot of people took notice and, and started looking at that design space, uh, myself included. So I went home and at the time, uh, Gerald Taylor had just put out the Synergy airfoil. So I took a look at what that would look like if I took the Synergy and just kept reducing the cord, reducing the cord until I got into the space that I was looking for. And I'm not going to say that I know what I'm doing as an aero designer, but that airplane actually came out pretty good. It was sub eight ounces, uh, homemade. It used um, spread toe uh, carbon for the wing skins. It had Kevlar discs or tails. We had our own pod boom uh, mold. And I actually still have that airplane if, you, if the picture's up uh, and you can see that it, it's very similar to what we're looking at here. And what I found was at the lighter weight, and I, I usually have to fly it with a little bit of lead in it because empty is actually a bit light. Too light. You can't throw it as high. Yeah. Um, what I found was that there were a couple of advantages. One is that you don't get tired at the end of a very long contest. And the other one is that it could work really light lift. Um, yeah. The only other airplane that I remember being in the range of being able to work at was like at the time the old Monarch uh, uh, Javelin plane. And then I had a, a Disser Twister one with a very light layup. Um, and it would work really light lift really well. Um, it was so light though that it wasn't dimensionally stable over a long period of time. So the, the skinny pickle with the bag solid core wing and the carbon skins, I actually still have it now, but eight years later and take it out and fly it periodically and it's still good. Yeah. The, the disadvantage of that airplane is that with the high aspect ratio thin wing, um, and I did have some flutter problems and I had to face the aileron as I got some practice with it um, almost all the way out, um, but it doesn't flutter. Uh, the disadvantage hey, of that airplane- face, uh, You said face, oh, I, I should know that word. Did you put- Face. Yeah, that, face. You, face you put the aileron some, with uh, glass. Because it was just raw foam and it was two, raw foam, two sheets. Exactly. Okay, and it, that was the flutter, helped the flutter. That didn't quite cut it, yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, that worked. The, the disadvantage of that airplane uh, is that I'm at the moment with my skill set not able to make as stiff a wing with blue foam and, and a bagged wing as can be made with a molded wing and a rotor core. So yeah, it launches okay, but it doesn't launch quite as high as some of the other planes because I know I'm giving up a little bit of energy as the airplane flexes <laughs> on the way around and then lets go of that energy. And that's of course lost from the, the throwing and, energy. And what was the core, you, what, what was the word you used for the core of the Falcon? What, what, what Rose core? Rosel. it's Rose Rose. Cell. So it's a foam, but a different type. It's a different uh, polymer from the polystyrene um, blue foam. So is it so more like a styrofoam cup, maybe, or, or what, what? No, it's actually um, stiffer and okay. maybe a little bit denser, but uh, more rigid. Yeah, so so our wings could kind of squeeze and unsqueeze, sort of thing. Well, right? they twist too a little bit. Twist, yeah. bend. Um, the, the, uh, so, and of course I, I still have the plane and, I, and I, I, I flew it for quite a while and still do. Um, and then I was watching the design space to see if anything came up that was worth buying that would give me a little bit of a, an advantage over what I built. Yeah. Um, and, and potentially if I were able to put that extra half ounce or ounce back in the plane, maybe I could make it stiffer and get it closer. But you know, we're talking about, it's a lot of work to make a homemade D 
BLG, as you know. <laughs> I know, as and, I know with Mike Tickle. At some point, your time is worth something. And, and as we get into this discussion, you'll see that there's certain advantage to buying a, an airplane. Um, yeah, like about 100 to 1 in labor costs. <laughs> well, that, yeah. Um, so I watched the design space, and the snipe came up, and it, it looked pretty good. I got some feedback from pilots that really liked it. I got some feedback from pilots who said that it was on the more challenging side to fly. Um, and if you were really good, you could take advantage of that. But if you uh, weren't quite that skilled, that there was a high pilot load on it. Um, and yeah. I, I can't confirm that. I've never flown one myself. I've flown against them and they seem very, very competitive. So for whatever reason, I just never was uh, tempted to, to acquire a snipe. And then I looked at the Flitz and then I looked at the Flitz 2. And as the Flitz 2 came on, it looked pretty good. And, you know, it just, there was a point in my life where I wasn't flying a lot of DLG and didn't make a lot of sense to acquire another one. And I didn't think it would be enough. I did actually fly against both, of, I believe, a Flitz 1 and a Flitz 2 in Arizona at the at their club. And they have a pretty active DLG scene yeah. going there. And it, they looked good. And it was, it was really a kind of a coin toss. And I ended up not getting one. Um, and then I also noticed in that design space, uh, I know Thomas has put out a couple planes and then there's the concept, uh, yes, spot, EDX5, right. um, which, which I, yeah, I picked. You've got an I flown and, and I actually got to admit when I flew your plane and threw it and felt the stiffness of it, I thought, okay, yeah, you there's some it. room here for gain and it's, it's time to start thinking about what I'm going to do next. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I and the flits too it was um was right up there too. I was deciding yeah. between the two. Yeah, right, right. So um, I had thrown someone's Falcon uh, a couple times. Um, I wasn't particularly happy with the way it was set up. And wasn't sure, you know, I, I like to set mine up a certain way and I'm very particular about that and, and other people like to set theirs up other ways. So unless it's mine, I'm not really comfortable making a call on, on how good a plane is until I've yeah. gone through my, myself, my own setup. Um, but it, the way it felt when I threw it gave me an idea that, okay, it's, it's probably there. Yeah. So an opportunity came up to, to get one from someone who was not going to finish it. And I picked it up and I got to admit, um, the kit quality is really, really good. I'm really, really impressed with the build quality, the materials, the engineering of it, um, the way it goes together. It, it, I've never put anything together that was this easy to get right. Yeah, which is pretty nice because in the old days, you just didn't even know where you were starting from practically yeah in the old days you kind of had to like make parts and <laughs> and uh cut things out yourself and fill in missing pieces and stuff and and align things you know uh by sight or string or however you feel it's best to do it or however they say to do it yeah um this thing is engineered in a way that like all that's been taken out mm -hmm. um so I, we can go through some of the pictures. There's a top shot of the wing um, that shows uh, just the paint quality. It's nice and crisp. Um, again, it comes with those fancy covers, so you don't have to leave that out in the sun all day. Um, let's see. By the way, Knowles, Knowles made covers similar to that. Um, from Home Depot, I guess they have some kind of silver line uh, insulation. Um, yeah. So, so that stuff right. is pretty nice. You can almost sew one, even though it's certainly nice to have it all fit and Velcroed and everything. Right. Yeah. These are these have sewn edges and Velcro, and it's they're they're not, they're padded on the inside, so it's yeah. silver on the outside and the padding. Is, it's, it's really really nice. It's really well thought out. So if you pull up the picture of the pod, um, it's generous enough that you can fit 
whatever are the current servos. This one happened to have bluebirds already uh, in process. So that's what I put in. Um, the only yeah, other I've, servo I I've heard people say they love bluebirds and I've had somebody else say stick with KSTs. So. Well, this has been my experience with these bluebirds. Um, they look nice. They, yeah, they, they have, look nice. <laughs> they have plenty of torque. They're small. They are easy to install. They fit. Uh, the arms are, are reasonable. Um, the one thing I noticed was that for, for the flaps, which, and, and it makes a difference whether you're using a pull spring or whether you're using a push rod. If you're using a pull spring, the servo is always in tension and it always comes back to the same center because it's never, it's never, there's never any hysteresis because it's not changing direction on the tension. Yeah. If you have a servo on a push rod and there's any hysteresis in the system at all, when you go one direction, it's gonna come back to one place. If you go another direction, it'll come back to another. And I actually did a test where I took all the servos that I owned at the time, at least the micros and, and probably a few others, and I double stick taped them to the, to the table. And I put a long, very thin piece of uh, stick wood out of a rubber band powered kit, the 16th inch thin stuff. Yeah. And then I had a block with a pin at the end of that. To give some friction, yeah. Yeah, and I put the, I put the servo so that that um, stick was almost touching the pin, right up to the pin. And I'd go one direction and come back to center and the other direction come back to center. One direction, other direction. And I have to say, the only servos that came back to center at the time, and this was, you know, 2013, the only servos that came back to center from either direction repeatedly every time were the MKS. Were what? MKS. MKS. They were, I think they were MKS 65, the one with the little can sticking out of that. Yeah, I mean, um, they, they always had a great reputation, but they've been kind of, they kind of pri are a little pricey. <laughs> they are a little pricey, but you get what you pay for. Um, I have not used the KST. I've heard good things about it. Uh, I would, if I were building another plane based on the reputation, I would get KSTs and do that same test to satisfy my own curiosity. Um, I'm not going to say that this is an issue with the Bluebirds. Um, they, they're pretty good, but I've noticed that if you're really, really, really watching closely, and again, it doesn't matter if you're on the sticks all the time. Yeah. But if you just hold it steady and you're not touching anything, then it matters where it centers back to. And I'm I'm very, very picky on that. So don't don't you use pull strings on your setups? I, I use pull string on the rudder and the elevator, but it's push rods on the aileron. Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. I forgot that. Yeah. And so the, and that's very uh, where it would really affect you. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you know, I, I've Blown the plane, it flies fine. I haven't noticed any, any okay. issues. Um, yeah. it's, it's fine. If you want to build it with Bluebirds, it's going to be fine, absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, but if I, if I were buying the servos, I might investigate a little bit more. And I'm not saying I'd go for the MKS, but I might yeah. if I was being really picky. Okay. Um, so if you pull up the picture of the rudder, I'm just going to show detail on the engineering here. Um, yeah. You can see the, the rudder is designed with a pocket on it that matches the boom perfectly. And I mean, when I say the mold work matches perfectly, it can only go one way. Yeah. So basically, you, you put it together, sight it with the wing, make sure you're happy with it. Then you put some CA on it, glue it on, and you're done. And there's none of yeah. this, is it straight or not? Or what if it bumps a little while I'm moving it from the table to where it's going to appear overnight or whatever? None of that. 
flip it on, glue it on, and it's done. And if you look, the, the mold work just rounds out and ends halfway through the rudder. And then they give you a little tiny, tiny diameter white plastic tube that just barely sticks out the end of that to give you a bearing surface for the wire. And I mean, the, the details go down to what kind of braided or twisted steel wire they pick to use for the pull spring. And it's, it's about the thinnest wire that I've seen. And it, it handles really well and it, it, it installed really well. And I'm, I'm just, I was just super impressed with the quality. Although I'm noticing, I, I've been watching the wires. I mean, we used to use these things that look like, you know, like telephone wire. And now yeah. they're getting very fine. And with them. so, so I, I've noticed that too. I, I think the new planes have these really thin wires. It's kind of nice. Yeah. I mean, you can get, uh, I think it's Dacron is, was one of the ones we used before. It's yeah. pretty good. It doesn't stretch very much. Uh, you can get Spectra fishing line. It's pretty good. You can hang it from your door with a weight on it overnight and pre-stretch it. And then it probably isn't going to stretch anymore. Um, then there was a Beetalon, which is steel wire with the yeah. plastic coating. That's pretty good. It doesn't stretch at all because it's steel. A tiny bit heavier because it's thicker yeah. um, and and it is thicker. This is like the beat along without the plastic coating. It's, it's just yeah, but really, it is. Really but it has like a plastic feel to it, so it, it like maybe they dip in plastic or something. I don't know, but it, it uh, because that's what I've I've been using. Nice. Beat along, it looks like wire, but there's some kind of it's like beat along. Yeah, has a, a plastic coating on it, very thin plastic coating. And again, that's it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Then if you go to the picture of the elevator, I mean, the, the pylon has the perfect hollowing out of the back of it to fit the control arm that goes there. It's a notched control arm. Um, he gives you the springs. He gives is that removable? Is it removable? It is a removable stab. Yeah. He gives you the springs. Uh, for the pull spring, and he gives you these tiny, tiny little steel tubes to accept the wire of the pull spring, which you then CA into the. Wow, that's a nice touch. Yeah, um, and uh, I don't know if it shows up on the picture, but if you look at the hinge, uh, I mean the hinge isn't just you know molded in and then cut. It's actually the V is molded into the hinge. Wow. And it has enough V in it that you can bend the rudder a little bit more than you'd ever want to bend it. So there's no like tension as it gets close to the maximum throw. Same with the elevator. There, the angle on that has been designed and, and built in with the with the hinge built in, you know, into the laminate so that it it actually has enough row without being too wide to give you like the perfect gap. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really impressive how carefully they thought this out. Um, the pylon looks like it's glued on, but I think they glued that on for you. Um, unless the person who had it before me glued it on. But I think the pylon is glued on for you. So it almost looks molded in. If you look really closely and feel it, you can feel the ridge. But again, the the mold from the pylon fits the mold of the boom perfectly. I mean, there's no gap at all. Yeah. Not like where you have you used to have to sand out the balsa part and then glue it on, and balloons. glass around it, you know. <laughs> uh, and the boom on this one, and, and people have different thoughts on this. This boom is, I would describe it as not not oval, but it's flat on the top and bottom and it's curved on the side and it's wider than it is tall yeah which is good for that's where the strain is right right so it, it because of the thickness it can bend more in the up down elevator direction it's very very stiff in the rudder direction and it's always a, uh, a call whether you want to make it more stiff one way or the other because you don't want your boom to flex in the elevator direction on the throw because then you lose some 
sit at some elevator pull on that pull up, uh, but you obviously don't want the rudder to flex on the on the throw either because then you're losing energy on the on the wag back and forth. Yeah. Um, but that's probably the right compromise, right? A little bit stiffer on the lat. So a little bit stiffer on the rudder, yeah. yeah. Especially for the big throwers. Um, and again, they have the the thing is like. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the weight a little bit here. I know these come out, you can get a light one in the low 200s, I think, grams. This one came out almost 250, which is about an ounce heavier than my skinny pickle uh, empty. I do balance the skinny pickle up a little bit, but not quite as heavy as this. And I can feel the difference in the weight when I throw this versus throwing the skinny pickle. And to be honest, when it's absolutely dead, dead calm, zero wind, no lift condition, I don't think I can throw this much, if any higher than the skinny pickle. Yeah. But as the wind picks up, when it hits, you know, four or five miles an hour, um, now the stiffness of the Falcon starts to really give you an advantage. Whereas in the, in the wind with the skinny pickup, because it's flexible, as you come into that headwind, the whole plane is bending and storing energy as elasticity rather than velocity. Yeah. And you subtract that from your launch. The Falcon, as it gets, the windier it gets, the higher you can throw it. And it seems uh -huh. I've, I've taken it out on some days when it was not like gale force uncomfortable, but certainly windy enough. And, and DLGs usually almost any wind kind of freaks you out with most DLGs. Yeah. And it, it just, it really came alive on the throw. Like I found myself now, the windier it got, the more competitive I got. But it, but it, could, it actually went higher in wind than it does Absolutely. with no wind. Absolutely. Now, because the relative, would... the relative velocity between the plane and the air is higher when it leaves your hand. Oh, because it's, so it's like it's going 20, 10 miles an hour faster or something. It's, yeah, it's the, same reason, it's the same reason when you fly a carrier, you fly, you head into the wind to take the plane off off the carrier because yeah. you get an extra however fast the carrier is going plus the wind velocity and and now you're you're um adding that to the velocity of the plane yeah. See, now i while you were talking i looked up 250 grams and so that was 8.8 .8 ounces so, so that's not super light is it it's not super light but is that your build or was it just your choice or um i don't know if this one was one of the windy versions oh okay or the medium version. I've heard that some of the medium ones come out in a range of like 230 to 250. The windy ones come out in the 250s. Yeah. Um, and the light ones you can get in the low 200s. Now, already owning a skinny pickle, I'm not sure I want to own one of these at the bottom range because I've already got that space covered. Yeah. Yeah. But what I do have now is a plane that becomes very competitive as the wind picks up. Yeah. And some wind is probably to be expected, so that's good. Especially towards the end of the day, if you're in a tournament, especially you're going to run into wind, especially towards the end of the day. Yeah, it can get quite strong, like at Poway at the end of the day. Yeah, um, and so this is still an airplane that's good. If you had to have one airplane, this would be a good choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could have a lighter one, you could get a light version of this and a windy version. Now the stronger throwers, I have read comments saying I can't imagine wanting one any lighter than 245 or 250 because yeah. they can throw that high launch without the wind. Yeah, yeah. Which I can't do right now. You, you know, one thing going back, you when you I, maybe this has to do with the fuse or maybe maybe the wing, but. Um, are all of them starting to put the uh, all four servos in the in the pod, or are they getting away from wing servos uh, for the ailerons? The flap well, that's an interesting balloons? question. Um, the trend has been towards the four in the pod, um, yeah. and I did that with a skinny pickle. Pickle, and the reason, well, 
the reason for that is as the wing gets higher aspect ratio and thinner, and this is yeah. apparently uh, derived from Gerald's synergy too, I think. Yeah. Um, as the wing gets higher aspect ratio and thinner, it becomes harder and harder to get a servo in there and hide it. Yeah. Um, I know the Flitz has had servos in the wing. Uh, and there's there's some others that do. I, I don't remember on the CX-5. It might have servos oh. in the wing. Um, they're in the wing. Yeah. So it's not so a wing. It, it's kind of a 50-50 yeah, so right now. Um, a lot of people are going for in the pod. Um, and I noticed the connection, maybe the connection to the wing was actually fairly clean. Sometimes I, like on the old Predators, I think it was a little, one of them had kind of a funky connection that seemed to be, you have to fool around with to build your, you know, put your wing on. Well, the problem, yeah, the problem with the four in the pod is you always have to come up with a way to put the push rods on the wing. Yeah. And there's different ways of doing it. Some people have them internal, some people have them external. Uh, the Falcon happens to be external, but it has a cutout um, here. So if you go back to the live, um, it, has um, a cutout. The it has a cutout here so that the push rods come out, but they actually are inside what would be the pod a little bit. Yeah. Um, before they connect the other on. So they are hanging out in the breeze, but they're not hanging completely out in the breeze compared to uh, like the Predator or the Skinny Pickle, which was just exiting out the side and, and connecting where it could. So it's okay, pretty well, clever that way. So I'm looking at the picture of the underside of the wing and it looks like you have two con uh, control horns on the ailerons. And yeah, they're just simple, simple control horns on the ailerons and they are external, but they're very close to the fuselage. And where do the, where do the uh, ro control rods come out? They come out the side of the fuse about an inch forward of that hinge line. And they're also done with that very thin white tubing that just barely pokes out of the side of the, the fuse. Okay. And so it pokes right behind the last screw on the wing? Is that? Uh, it's in front of the last screw, actually. Oh, OK. Because yeah, in your picture, right. I don't see any holes. I was just wondering. Yeah. OK. Um, and then I don't know if you can see it on the picture of the bottom of the wing. But oh, I okay, I get it. There's no there, holes in the wing. Yeah, yeah there the wings held on with two Phillips head screws. Yeah, and the way they've done the mold work is there's a cone shaped interface between the fuse and the wing, so there's no there's no ambiguity about like lining it up. It, right, and everything is streamlined too. Yeah, yeah it's all streamlined. Plan. All the mold parts fit perfectly, and when it locks together, it, it's made it perfectly, and it can't go any other way. Yeah, yeah, um, which is really really nice. Um, and I guess as far as like the four in the pod versus the two in the wing, if you got four in the pod, you can take nose weight out. Um, because the servos are farther forward. Um, but you may not want to because you don't want to put too much weight too far forward because it's uh, then got a, um, the farther away the weight is from the center of gravity, the more swing you're going to get on your, yeah. on your launch. Um, and the way I did mine is I did the receiver in the back, the servos in the middle, and the battery in the front. And that seemed to work okay. You could probably put the receiver in the front and the servos in the back. I've seen people do it that way. It makes it a little bit challenging to hook up the ailerons because your connection gets really short. And you've got very little space to work in. But you get a shorter connection, which means it's less prone to uh, flutter or distortion or anything like that. Okay. So it's a tough call, 50-50. You got you to look at your components, what size they are, uh, where they fit best, and, and how it fits. But in this airplane, there is enough room to put everything in 
without working with mirrors and dental tools and magnifying glass, which is nice. stats. <laughs> yeah. So that part, uh, of course, is really nice. And then um, the last picture I'll show is the throwing peg, which is pretty cleverly designed. Um, it is a uh, blade type. Uh, it, it comes with a generous blade in case you have very large hands. Uh, in my case, I was able to remove, I don't know, 40% of the, of the mass of the throwing peg in the blades to fit my fingers perfectly. And then of course I like to round it and customize it to my fingers. But he also gives you a little tiny, or no, actually it's molded into the peg. Molded into the peg is the missing piece of the wing <laughs> that would bridge the, the tip where you're inserting this. So it's not like it has a notch. Yeah. The thing is, and it can be inset a little bit and it all lines up perfectly. And it, I mean, it actually, it's pretty good. It's not, it's not like a, <laughs> not like, a, like, a like, like a piece of tube, like we used to use. <laughs> yeah, not like a piece of tube, like we used to use. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, it's pretty good. I gotta admit, and the, the, the insertion of the blade, the way they do it, I can't remember exactly how I hollowed it out and included it in there, but, Certainly, it is the best, cleanest, less least skin disturbing blade installation that I have. Yeah, yeah. It's just a remarkable, yeah. Yeah. So I've only had this for a few weeks finished. And I mean, it only took me like a couple of days to put the whole thing together, and I was not pushing it. Yeah. Uh, when I say it's well engineered, it's really, really well engineered, and it's extensively documented all the different ways you can configure it and, and put it together. And they do a, a really nice job of it. And they've got all the pieces you need included, and it all fits and it all works. And like, I had to, I had to acquire like a couple pieces of balsa to break the push rods, and I made my own servo tray out of plywood instead of the one they gave me because the guy I got it from had already started cutting on it. So I just used that. Yeah. Um, other than that, like everything's there and it all fits and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. And I've, I've flown it in anywhere from absolute dead calm to not, not the limit of what you would fly a DLG in, but you know, some wind. Yeah. And I really felt good with it over most of those conditions yeah and i have yet to take it out with a skinny pickle on a completely dead day and clock it or something like that to see um but i think like on the, on the absolute dead end of the scale it's probably about the same and then as the wind picks up, it just gets better and better and better and better. Yeah. And the flying qualities of it, um, I'll go on a little side note here. When you mentioned the four in the pod versus the wing servos, there's a third option now on the table that people are, are talking about, which is the four full servo house. wing. A what? Four servo wing. Yeah, I was going to say full house <laughs> deal. Yeah. And, and that was the rage back in the days of the Vandal and the, and the uh, Encore, you could get a four servo wing and it made a pretty nice handling plane. It was good for quick turnarounds because you could break with the flaps all the way and you still had a high amount of aileron throw to control. Um, and four servo wings just turn better. Yeah, because they're optimized for the amount of throw at that particular point of the wing. And I understand why people are looking at it now because it makes a really nice plane. And they've gotten the servos down. It's like an arms race between the thickness of the airfoil and the aspect ratio and then the servos. And they've gotten the servo small enough that you can put one in the wing and drive the aileron and still hide it in the wing, which is yeah. pretty impressive. Um, and I forget that the, the trade-off, like you can, you can, 
gain a little here and give up a little there and it ends up not weighing very much more by doing that. Yeah, I, I heard some criticism. I mean, I know one would be just the complexity of, of setting it up and... Yeah, I mean, the complexity, there's, there's no doubt there is that extra plug and wires and, and yeah. all that. And you're gonna have to put a, another level of attention to detail to fit all that stuff in this tiny space. Yeah. But, but have heard, say, kind of, you think it might be a trend? No, I, I think there's something there. Yeah. And that the explanation behind it is it doesn't perform any better for a top pilot. Oh. For, for anybody but a top pilot, it takes some workload off of the pilot. Yeah. Which gives you a net gain. And I believe that's true having flown enough different kinds of planes. Yeah. That said, the Falcon with the plane four servo setup handles really, really well. Yeah. Um, it circles well. It's extremely aerobatic, um, more so than any of my other planes. You could haul it around and crank it and roll in a loop and, and cubinate and and you can crank it really hard and it just does it. It's like a, you know, it's like flying a regular plane and then flying a a pit special, you know, it's, it's super aerobatic. And, and that part of it, without having to have a four servo wing, that part of it is really fun. Yeah. It makes it, aside from being competitive, it's a really fun airplane to fly. Yeah. Um, and there are people around with a uh, snipe and another Falcon and I've seen a couple other uh, competitive airplanes in the neighborhood. So I am very much looking forward to going out and flying against other people and seeing how this actually stacks up. I know, we need a, a, a fun fly at least and maybe a real contest. Right. I, I've, it's been on my to-do list, but um, <laughs> I'm kind of stacked up. But that's great. Wow, Greg, thank you. Sure. Uh, any conclusion? So just basically, it's a great, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing this with some of them, like the RE John talked about, he was pretty thrilled about it. And I've been thrilled with my CX-5. It's almost like we've, they've taken a step function up in, in quality and ability. And They have. I mean, the, the manufacturing, the mold work, the design, the aero, um, they've all taken a step up. You have to, because if you don't, then you're not competitive anymore. It's, yeah. And they, they are just getting better and better and better. Um, yeah. I don't know where it goes from here. You know, I might, I might end up flying this airplane for eight years um, now because I really like it. Um, and it, it seems to be very durable too. Yeah. Very stiff uh, and it feels really solid. So I think it will last. Great. Okay. Well, anything else to, to add or? No, I, that, I'm just uh, really happy about getting in. And, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily looking for it, but someone had one and, and wasn't sure they wanted it anymore. So. Yeah, I think he injured his shoulder or something. I got it. Yeah, I, I got it. So. Yeah. Oh, and, and uh, Dominic, Dominic's got one too. He's so. got one of these. He's also got a snipe. So I'm looking forward. And it, could even be this weekend if he's around uh, to go out and a little mono mono <laughs> man oh man and see how it is you know okay um, I'll, I'll say like prior to the skinny pickle i've had a couple of twisters i've actually had all the twisters and the predator taboo taboo Don't forget the taboo in the tree <laughs> um i built my own super g's back in the day when it was hard to get good materials and they didn't come out as good as Mark's yeah. own copies and they, they weren't that good. Um, not the ones we built. Um, and, you know, I've, I've tried a lot of stuff and this is, this is pretty good. Yeah. So no new builds in the near future. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, scratch builds. <laughs> not for, not for DLG. I've got a potentially a 60 inch slope racer at least okay. in my head that 
that I'd like to put together. Um, and that, that's really the only thing left uh, that I would say I'm missing that I want. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate it. Okay. So, yeah, so take care and I hope to be flying with you soon. Okay, sounds good. See you out the field. All right, bye.